in Galatians 2, verse 16, Paul says this. A man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Not justified by the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm Peter Cavanna, and uh, welcome back to our lecture series on the New Testament. And uh, we have the joy of looking at Galatians in this session. An introduction to the Epistle to the Galatians, a very vibrant and lively and exciting uh, part of the New Testament. One of the most, uh, what shall we say, dramatic epistles of the Apostle Paul. And uh, in our in our time together, we will, of course, look at the origins of the epistle. I'll talk to you a little bit about its purpose. And then we'll conclude by thinking about just some of its content, some of the teaching that we find in the epistle. So beginning with its with its origins, uh, we know that it is written by the Apostle Paul, because the epistle tells us that it is in uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. And uh, we also have Paul mentioned by name in chapter 5 and verse 2. And uh, no one in scholarship seriously doubts uh, the authenticity of Paul as the writer. But let me introduce you to a problem that you... <laughs> probably didn't know you had or that you didn't have before and that's this chapter 1 verse 1 says it's the epistle of Paul to the Galatians but a really good question is who are the Galatians now believe it or not there are two uh, quite different theories uh, in Bible scholarship and in Bible studies as to who the Galatians might have been. And this is to do with uh, geography um, rather than ethnicity. But there's such a thing as the North Galatian theory and, wait for it, the South or the Southern Galatian theory. Either the Galatians are a group of people uh, living in Galatia proper. Now, Galatia proper uh, is the domain of the Gauls. Uh, they were uh, immigrants from Celtic Europe, actually, and had settled in that area. North Galatia, a mountainous area, um, like I say, the home of the Gauls, or... Paul may have written this epistle to those in the south. And uh, so let's just unpack a couple of uh, those details with you. Um, if Galatians is written to churches that are in the northern area, um, let me actually, let me just explain what I mean by this. Uh, both areas were known as Galatia. They're both validly called Galatia because one is originally called Galatia and the other from about 25 BC when it was taken over by the Romans. The whole province was called Galatia. And so when Paul writes to the Galatians, what we can't be sure about is whether he is using the original name of Galatia, which would be in the north, or whether he could be using the Roman name for Galatia, which would encompass uh, the southern cities, places like Lystra and Antioch, Antioch in Pisidian, that is, uh, Iconium and Derby. And I remember when I used to try to explain this when I was teaching this at college, I found this was the best way I could describe it. I wanted to imagine. Now, this illustration may work best if you're from the UK. So forgive me if you're watching this 
from outside the UK. I hope you'll still be able to follow it. I want you to imagine that Scotland, which is the northern part of the British Isles, right? I want you to imagine that that, that Scotland took over uh, England as well. And uh, just to be fair, we'll say they we'll say they took over Wales too. So Scotland have now taken over Wales and England, and so the whole of the British Isles would now be called Scotland. And I want you to imagine that that happened at a certain date in history, but then you found a document written about fifty years or so maybe 75 years into that transition that said to the people of Scotland, you might ask yourself, well, does the writer mean the original Scotland? You know, that that area of land and community up in the north? Or does Scotland to this writer now mean the whole of the British Isles? OK, it's not a great illustration, but that's the scenario that we face when we ask ourselves, who were the Galatians? Now, if the northern theory is correct, then it changes the dating of the epistle uh, considerably, certainly by many, many years, because there's no record of Paul and Barnabas visiting those northern mountainous areas on their first missionary journey. Now, there are a couple of references to Paul being in the region of Galatia, travelling through Galatia, but we don't read of those until his second and third missionary journey. And there are only fleeting references at that in Acts 16 and verse 6 and in Acts 18 and verse 23. So it could be that these Galatians are converts, Christians, that came into being as a result of the apostles' preaching and church planting on his second and third missionary journey. But if that's the case, then it's a good deal later in time than it would be if, say, they had been planted on his first missionary journey, which would be the Southern Galatian theory. Now, let me tell you why I think probably the Southern Galatian theory is to be preferred. But it's purely what, what I think and what I prefer. It may or may not be the case. But here's why I think the Southern Galatian theory is, is probably more accurate. Uh, number one, as we've said, there's no record of Paul visiting uh this area in his first missionary journey. Now you say, well, why couldn't it be the second and third missionary journeys? Well, because uh, Acts 15 is a key moment in the history of the church. You may remember that there is a council at Jerusalem and the big debate is over how are they going to deal with Gentiles now being part of the church and what sort of regulations and rules are they going to place upon the Gentiles? So have a read of Acts 15 and, and you'll see that, that whole uh, discussion led by James. And then as Acts 15 ends, we, we enter into Acts 16 and Paul goes to deliver the results of that meeting to some of the churches. Now, what we find when we read the book of Galatians is no reference at all to the Acts 15 council. There's no reference. And, and by the way, uh, the other apostles are mentioned and their, their authority and approval uh, does get mentioned. Paul talks about how he was approved by the other apostles. So it's not as though the Galatians had never heard of people like Peter and James. They certainly had. But what we find is no reference to the decision of that council in the epistle to the Galatians. 
which makes me suspect, and many others, that it was written before the Council of Jerusalem. Perhaps at the end of Paul's first missionary journey, before he launched out onto his second one. Another reason why we might think that the Southern Galatian theory is to be preferred is because of a little reference Paul makes uh, in Galatians chapter 4. Why don't you turn to that? Galatians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 13, where Paul talks about an illness that he was um, suffering when he was in the presence of the Galatians. Have you found Galatians 4 verse 13? He says, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. So you can read a little bit more about what he has to say about that illness here. At one point he says, you were so good to me, uh, I think you would have torn out your own eyes if you could have done, which may infer, but by no means is certain, that Paul's problem was an eye problem. But like I say, we can't really be sure. What we can know is that he was ill. Now, the northern Galatian territory is a mountainous, difficult area. And it just seems less likely that Paul would have traversed a mountainous region, um, which today would be in modern day Turkey, um, if he wasn't very well. And so some of the arguments for the, for, the, for the South or the Southern Galatian theory seem to work quite well. Now, the reason why any of that is important is because if it is true that the Galatians are those in the southern area, the Roman province of Galatia, then it means rather rather wonderfully that we have uh, a record of these churches because Paul's missionary journey in Acts 13 and Acts 14, where he visits these cities, notably four of them, uh, you know, we're able to read about it. So these are the churches that he planted, uh, starting in Antioch, and then have a look at Acts 14 as well, and you see miracles in in um, Derby and uh, uh, and uh, Lystra and Iconium. I mean, they they really have. Uh, Paul and Barnabas really have a wonderful, fruitful time, although they are driven out of every city they're in because of persecution. We'll get back to that a little bit later on. So, assuming the Southern Galatian theory, that means Paul perhaps wrote to these churches uh, something like 50 AD, before, maybe even 49, you see, before the Jerusalem Council that we believe did happen round about 50 AD. And uh, and that would fit with uh, so many um, of the facts, because in Acts 16 uh, and verse 4, that's when they travel to deliver the news. Well, like I said, had that decision already been reached, it seems almost certain to me that we would find it in the pages of the epistle to the Galatians. Uh, let's think about the purpose of the epistle. For sure, things have gone very badly wrong, as far as Paul was concerned, in the churches of Galatia, wherever they were, north or south. Why don't you look in Galatians chapter 3, and we'll just read the first few verses of that chapter. What had happened in Galatia was this, that a group of uh, erroneous teachers had arrived. Paul had come, planted the churches, was happy. Uh, if we are looking at Acts 14 as the place where he was doing that, he appointed elders. We read of that in Luke's version of the events. 
and then he left. After he left, and largely because of persecution which occurred, and again, we read a lot about that persecution in Acts 14, a group often called by scholars the Judaizers, a group of teachers that were among the churches and saying things like this. Yes, it's, it's fine to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but, but you can't think of yourself as being saved and made right by faith alone. You need to keep the Torah. You need to keep the law of Moses as well. For example, you must be circumcised and you must keep special holy days. Uh, yeah, it's fine to believe in Jesus, but you also have to obey the law of Moses and particularly the ritual side of the law of Moses. What's Paul's response to this? Well, like I said, this is a very dynamic and emotive epistle. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. You foolish Galatians, Paul says, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. By the way, I love that because, of course, the Galatians didn't see the crucifixion of Jesus, but they did see it through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Wonderful, isn't it? I would like to learn just this one thing from you, he says in verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? Or by believing what you heard. Verse 3. Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Does God, verse 5, give you his Spirit and work miracles among you, like the ones perhaps we read in Acts 14, because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard. Paul was so uh, incensed by this. In fact, go back to chapter one, where he calls it a different gospel that people should have to mix uh, ritual Judaism with simple Christian faith. Paul doesn't think of that as, you know, not exactly right. He calls it out as a completely different gospel. Have you found chapter one? Look at verse six. I am astonished, he says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion, he says, and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But... Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. So here is such uh, an emotional, um, angry, uh, agonizing epistle from Paul. You know, even what we just read there in, in verse 6, this is how the epistle begins. There are no words of commendation. There's no, there's no friendly chit-chat from Paul here. Uh, almost straight away, he launches into this tirade and you just sense his pain and his agony. Agony. 
I, I want you to be aware, and this might help you as you read Galatians and indeed, you know, many of the New Testament epistles, that when we talk about Paul wrote the epistle, actually, in many cases, probably a scribe wrote it uh, while Paul preached it, you know. And so Paul here, uh, whenever I read Galatians, I always see Paul pacing backwards and forwards, um, you know, really heartbroken while someone else is writing down the things that Paul has said. And then something very interesting happens. Uh, just go to the end of Galatians, if you will, chapter 6. And uh, not quite the end, but verse, verse 11. When we get to verse 11, Paul says this, See what large letters I use as I write you with my own hand. It's almost as though at the end, Paul says to the scribe, Give me the writing uh, equipment. I'm going to write this last bit in my own hand. This is, this is my handwriting now. Yeah, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of passion uh, in this epistle. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. And we see uh, Paul's purpose here in writing it. He says this in words that I know are, are very well known in the, in the Christian faith. But I want you to see them now, perhaps more accurately in their context. Galatians 5 verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. This is the freedom from religious ritual and putting our faith in religious ritual to save us. It may be true that being a Christian sets us free from many things. Actually, I think it also makes us a slave of many things, rightly so. We are slaves of righteousness. Anyway, I'll save that for another time. But here he's saying we are set free from having to, to uh, engage in rituals in order to be saved. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do not then stand firm and do not then be burdened or let yourself be enslaved again by the yoke. Don't allow yourself to go back into your chains. The chains here, not so much of sin, but of religious ritual. Mark my words, Paul says, I tell you, there's that second reference to Paul's name that I mentioned. If you let yourselves be circumcised, he says, Christ will be of no value to you. Well, oh, this is strong stuff. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is required to obey the whole law. You're trying to be justified by law. And you who are doing that have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the spirit, the righteousness for which we hope for, he says in verse six, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Jump down to verse 11. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, he's now talking about the, the false teachers or the preachers of another gospel. He says, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Gosh, is that in the Bible? <laughs> you, my brothers, were called to be free. And then just go over to chapter 6. And uh, we already read verse, verse 11. So here's Paul now having 
it seems to me, taken hold of the scroll. Now he's writing this personally in his own hand. Verse 12, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And then he says something here that sort of gives away what it's all about. He says, the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So Paul is saying that the reason why people have gone back into these rituals and and why these people are preaching that is to give themselves a quiet life. There's a challenge for us today uh, to preach things that are more acceptable in the culture in which they were set, right? No, not even those who are circumcised obey the law, he says. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast, he says, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. So we see the the deep frustration of the apostle. Now do you understand that if there'd been a Jerusalem council where all the apostles had agreed on matters such as we're reading here, that Paul would almost certainly have made mention of these to strengthen his case. That's why I suspect that this is one of the very early New Testament epistles. If you go to back to chapter 4, it's not just circumcision, but in in verse 9, he says, But now that you know God or are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Are you with me in Galatians 4 and verse 9? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? The slavery here is the Judaistic ritual of circumcision but then there's more because he says you are observing special days and months and seasons and years i fear for you that somehow i've wasted my efforts on you paul is realizing that these people were were turning back to the judaism that they knew the honour and, and uh, sacred reverence of special days. I think it's quite a challenge for Gentile Christians as well who have perhaps embraced some of this even into our Gentile Christianity that there are special or holy days. Not that we can't celebrate things but not that, but that by celebrating them we are saved. That's not the case at all. And I think we need to be a little bit careful of that. And so let me think about the contents of this epistle. First of all, Paul wants to establish his authority with the Galatians. This is perhaps because it had been challenged by the Judaizers. They'd kind of said, well, who is Paul to tell you how to live? Who is Paul to preach a gospel to you? Well, as we read Galatians carefully, and I want you to follow in your Bible now, you'll see that on a number of occasions in this epistle, Paul is very clear that he has authority from Jesus and from heaven. And the gospel he preached is not something that he made up. So go right back to the beginning. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle. And he says here, sent not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me. So he's beginning his epistle. Now, I know he normally says, hello, this is Paul, an apostle of Jesus. 
But just look at this. I I wasn't sent by men. But I've been sent by Jesus. And I've been sent by the Father to preach the gospel to you. It's a very strong uh, opening. Come down to verse 11. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. Now, I know you've read these verses maybe many times before, but now I want you to see why they're there. What What's Paul trying to do? He's trying to re-establish his authority as an apostle, not in a not in a way to give himself esteem, uh, but but to but to present the gospel to them from his own lips, that it's authoritative and and that it's the truth. I want you to know, brothers. Verse 11, chapter 1, that the gospel I preached to you is not something that man made up. I didn't receive it from any man, Paul says, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And so Paul begins to unpack this. This is the gospel that he preached Go to verse 15 of chapter 1. Verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace. Paul had just told them what a great uh, uh, Jew he was, that he was advancing in Judaism. uh, And that he was, you know, uh, 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 you know, an expert, an authority an esteemed teacher of the law. But now he wants to break with that and say, but God sent, set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, he says, when he was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. It's interesting, this this whole thing about Paul um, going into um, Arabia and spending time alone with God, sort of like the the, uh, missing years that we find in Galatians. Have a read of it and you'll see um, what I mean. Um, Much of this is to do with him receiving revelation. But another wonderful thing is because we get these various dates, 14 years later, chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, chapter 118 gives us a reference to three years. And so by sort of dating when we think Paul went to Jerusalem for the very first time, we can get an approximate date on the, the events of the road to Damascus, Acts 9, when Paul is converted. Uh, or receives his call to the Christian faith at, you know, something like 32 um, AD. So we're able to work out some of the timelines of Paul, even from these references here. But the reason for these references is, is not to help us with dating. It's actually Paul establishing his authority that perhaps the Judaizers had uh, had undercut, you know, In Galatians 6 and verse 17, right at the end of the epistle, just have a look at it. He says this, I don't want anyone to cause me trouble. So this is how he sort of ends. Don't anyone cause me trouble, he says, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. You know, he's saying uh, that the Judaizers have an easy life. They are trying to, uh, uh, um, you know, get out of being persecuted. They're trying to have a, a much simpler life. They don't want opposition from the culture in which they're in. So they've opted not to have these these uh, uh, times of persecution. Paul he, himself has chosen to suffer for Christ. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And once again, going back to our southern galatian theory but we find that in every place where paul preached in southern southern galatia acts 14 we find that he was driven out always by persecution in fact uh where is it in acts 
14 and verse 19 is where he's stoned and and it seems like stoned to death and the brothers gather around him and he leaps up and he he goes back in to preach in the city uh paul may even be referencing here in galatians 6 17 he may even be referencing that occasion don't you remember that i was stoned almost to death for this gospel so Paul's way of establishing his his apostleship is is to talk about uh, his connection with the apostles. We find that in Galatians chapter two. So have a read of that sometime too, where he talks about receiving the right hand of fellowship, and they 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 the apostles at Jerusalem approved of Paul. But not only did the apostles approve of Paul. But God approved of Paul by revealing Jesus to him. And he says, if you want further proof that I'm an apostle, I've got the marks to prove it. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I've suffered for this faith, he says. A second area of teaching we ought to look at would be the issue of faith and law. The whole concept of justification by faith turn in your bible to galatians chapter 3 where we can have a little look at this together um, faith and law justification by faith paul is wanting to say that the real children of abraham are not those who have been circumcised, but actually are those who share the faith of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6. Consider Abraham, he says, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Quoting from Genesis chapter 15. So he wants to assure the Galatians that by believing God is to be credited with righteousness, just like Abraham was. He continues, verse 7, understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The inference is not those who follow rituals or who have been circumcised. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Wonderful. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So he says, you, you are part of Abraham's family when you share his faith. Go to verse 20, 23. He says, before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. In the Greek, there's a really interesting expression says something like the law was was the school teacher or the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ it was the law was just school now we're out of school now we're into life if you like that we might be justified by faith in verse 25 Galatians 3 now that faith has come we are no longer under the supervision of the law we're not supposed to be in school anymore school's out and now we have this new life of faith in jesus christ let's go back to verse 10 of galatians 3 all who rely on observing the law are under a curse for it is written cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law and he puts here in verse 11, clearly no one is justified 
before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. They're, of course, quoting Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. That's a very popular verse to be quoted in the New Testament. Christ redeemed us, verse 13, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Of course, as a classical Pentecostal and charismatic Bible teacher, I always love to see these references to the presence of the Spirit in the early church. So Paul wants to assure them that, that we are justified before God by faith. We have been credited with righteousness. And remember the context. He's saying this to a group of churches who are being tempted to go back into old religious mindsets, religious rituals. In fact, they're being taught to do so by the Judaizers. Well, I mentioned the Holy Spirit. Now let's think about spirit and life. Turn, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5. Now, the verses we're going to read here are actually quite well known uh, because they're so preachable. But I just want you to keep your Bible student's hat on, OK, as we read them, because remember that Paul is talking about the difference between trying to keep the law, trying to uh, observe the commandments of Judaism, particularly the ritualistic elements of Judaism, such as circumcision and observing holy days, versus the much more superior and indeed successful life that one can have in the spirit. So he says in verse 16, I say to you, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Or of course, as we know in the Greek, the flesh. The sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary uh, to the sinful nature. So Paul says there's a battle going on on the inside. And the only way you're going to win that battle is by crucifying your own desires. It's not going to come about by rituals. It's not going to come about by circumcision. It's not going to come about by observing special holy days and special feasts and years and seasons. It's going to come about by crucifixion. Paul says in Galatians 6 and in verse 8, he says this, a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his flesh from that nature will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, well, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So what Paul isn't saying in Galatians is that people can live how they want. Just because you separate yourself from the religious observance of the law doesn't mean that you're free to live how you want to live. That's not the message either. Once we have been justified by faith, Paul says, then, of course, we live in the life of the Spirit and we walk in the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. That's what he uh, says here in Galatians 5 and verse 25. And the result of that are these wonderful uh, character traits that we often call the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, 
named here in verse 22 of Galatians 5 as, of course, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so to be apart from ritual observance is to receive the Spirit. And if we sow, he says, to the Spirit, if we live a life in the presence and in obedience to the inner will of the Spirit, then we won't gratify, he says, the desires of the flesh. We have been crucified, he says, so that we no longer do those kinds of sinful acts anymore. The ones mentioned in Galatians 5, 19, 20, 21. Those are not part of the, of the Christian's life today. Go back to Galatians 2 and verse 20 and we'll conclude our lecture time just by looking at this particular verse Galatians 2 and verse 20 Paul says this I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Jesus Christ now lives in me and the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul's message to them is this. In fact, you could argue that observing the rituals of Judaism, although they were dead works as far as Paul was concerned, they were perhaps easier to do than what he was asking of them. He was asking them as he had always asked in all of his gospel preaching that people should turn wholeheartedly to the life that Jesus offered. And here he says that he had been crucified. He says in Galatians that Christians have to put to death those desires that they have. Well, that might be a little bit more of a war and a little bit more of a journey than just going through rituals. And yet, he says, this is how we're going to lead successful Christian lives. Sometimes today in the church, we hear a lot about people seeking deliverance. They talk about problems that they have and they feel they need to be delivered of things. They need their chains broken. We hear that quite a lot. May the Lord release us from our chains. Mm, I'm not so sure. In first century Christianity, the secret of the Christian life was not deliverance. It was crucifixion. And so when we are crucified, we have what Galatians 6 promises. We are a new creation. Verse 15. And by sharing in Abraham's faith, we, come, we become part of the Israel of God. Galatians 6 and verse 16. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said, and I no longer live. <laughs> 